really researching late period shields for about the past five years. The, it started with a really simple project. It started with this guy right here. Um, most of you will probably recognize this as a Tallhofer shield. Um, it's what I call a scalloped shield. It's really a buckler. But uh, I started this because I'm a blacksmith. And I wanted a shield, but I didn't want a shield that I had to replace every three to five years. So I thought it said, aha, I'll make a metal shield. And there were, I knew, uh, metal bucklers. So I tried to recreate one. And when I did, I discovered that this little guy had a lot more features built into it than I really expected. Um, and as I looked at the art, of the 15th century. It was primarily the 15th century that we're going to be concerned with, although there's quite a bit of bleed from the 14th century to the 16th century on either side because, you know, interesting things don't start and end at the century mark. Um, so to really build our, to, to start a conversation about what's going on with shields in the 15th century, I would like to start with the progression of shield technology um, up through the Middle Ages. So I'm going to start with a very clunky um, Scadian standard heater shield. Uh, this is a center grip. Uh, I've also rigged it so that it can be a, um, what would you call, center strapped shield, which is in the illumination, what you see most of in the 15th century, thats I found that very interesting, but I'll get into that later. Um, hey, real quick. Have, yes? Sorry. I just, sorry, I meant to um, do the disclaimer at the very beginning. Sorry. Um, if um, this is being recorded, it will be uploaded on um, YouTube. If you don't want to be recorded, either turn off your camera and change your name or go to Facebook if I can get up there. That's it, sorry to interrupt. All right, back with shields. Um, one of the, the beauties of the center grip round shield was um, what has come to be called in HEMA circles, opening and closing the door. Uh, so uh, although in art, what you see a lot of is um, the shield facing straight at the opponent. Uh, a lot of our reenactors who are also experimental archeologists, uh, their recreations of early period combat show a lot more um, fighting with the shield as kind of an open door. You see, um, that actually imitates uh, I-33 or 133 that we see, and that's what, in the 13th century, I believe? Um, but this, this idea of presenting the shield face towards the threat rather than keeping it static, okay? Um, later on, we see the advent of strapping. Uh, and even, even, in the, even in the dark ages, we did see strapped shields. A strap shield become much more common when the shield is used by cavalrymen. And we see the typical, um, though I don't have a strap heater actually. This is about the strapping that you see in the, let's call it the high medieval period. Um, and especially with the heater, that gives us a lot of Stay. Um, assuming this was strapped. Um, especially the way that we fight in the Middle Kingdom. Um, we fight strapped like this, 
so that this leading corner is about in the middle of our head and the tail faces towards the opponent. Uh, we have a, a very boxer stance. Uh, but that's not what we see in period art. Um, in period art, we see a lot more um, center strapping. So uh, with a center strapped shield, you'll have the leading edge or the leading corner protecting the head and the tail much more pointed out. Um, but that might not be such a problem if you're fighting with full leg harness, which is what we see in, in the 15th century. At the end of the 14th century, as shields become somewhat superfluous, thanks to the advent of plate armor, we see two paths of development. People tried to improve the shield, and they tried to add functionality to the shield. Now, those are two different things. Like if you have a round shield, and you want to make a better round shield, what could you do to it? You could add a dome to it so that there are increased glancing surfaces. You could add a, a rim outside the dome, creating an inside corner that could act to catch blades. You could increase the diameter of the dome. You could put a bipod on it so that you could use it as a steady rest for your crossbow. Uh, or no, excuse me, that would be adding, adding functionality to the shield. Other, well, what I had been saying was you could improve the shield and then you can add, add new tools to the shield also. You could, you could add that bipod. You could add, a, add spikes to it. You could add a claw to rip your opponent's shield away. And so we see these two paths of development that are intersecting at times and then wildly divergent at others. That's what's going on with shields in the 15th century. People were trying to improve the mousetrap. And we see this explosion of variety in 15th century shields that later eventually peters out because people, probably thanks to the advent of firearms, figured that the, that the game just wasn't worth the candle. Uh, so let's start with the earliest development of complex shields. Um, I've looked through thousands and thousands of images and must have hundreds of examples of these complex shields. And I've set them into what? Almost a dozen varieties, um, distinct varieties. But what, what I'm going to start with is our earliest evolution, which uh, starts from the humble heater shield. So let's see if this works. Do a screen share here. All right. Do we see this fellow? Um, this is in Italy, uh, circa 1410. So this is contemporaneous to uh, Agincourt, the end of the Hundred Years' War. And what we see is this, uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor. Can you, can you see my cursor? All right. Uh, this cutout, uh, what we commonly call a lance rest, this is the bouche uh, or the mouth. Uh, and initially it was indeed used as a lance rest. Let me see if I can uh, find, yes, here. Just a second again. Share screen. Here we go. Okay, so you can see that the bouche was indeed used as a lance rest. It, it steadied the lance um, and the, the shield was regular heater size, or what we expect to be uh, uh, the, the standard heater size, um, still obviously functional in a cavalry role. Um, but shortly thereafter, you see um, additional changes 
to the shield to make the to make the shield ever more functional let's go here share how about this all right so you can still see that the bouche or the mouth is functional as a lance, lance rest still but we've turned up front edge and the back edge, or the top and the bottom of the shield. Um, again, functional in a cavalry roll that would, you know, glance the lance away from your face. Um, but shortly thereafter, let's see. Yes, okay. Let's look at these guys. Now, these fellows are still using that same type of shield, but they don't have the mouth. They're using the upturned edges of the shield, and at this point, the edge is turned up all the way around the shield. Um, and they're using them in a foot combat role. Now, just from looking at it, I think we can, we can figure out what those upturned lips would be useful for. Uh, let's grab this guy. This guy will come much later. But you can see that the, the shape of the shield is broadly like a C. So if we're fighting um, standard baton combat, which is a perfectly period thing to do, um, as we do in SCA armored combat, we are striking uh, percussively and then using the percussion to redirect our weapon and strike in a, at a different angle. That's not what the masters who wrote the fencing treatises are telling us to do. Uh, but that is what we can do. We have very, very clear depictions that their own baton combat did exactly the same thing. But if you read Fiore, for instance, he will say, uh, cut like you thrust and thrust like you cut. And so he's saying, don't just cut, but rather cut, extend when you cut. And also don't simply thrust in line but thrust so that you would have a, a, a pushing cut as you thrust. In that kind of combat environment, very quickly, um, you don't just want to bounce off the shield and redirect your attack. You want to um, re-angle your attack and continue, the, uh, continue pushing forward. If you encounter a flat surface, like a buckler, assistant piece. This is my brother Wilhelm. Um, so, if I'm blocked off to the side, what I naturally want to do is roll around and continue the attack. But there's a couple of things that these new shields allow us to do. One is the upturned edge. So, if I if my thrust is caught on the shield, here, hold this one up too. If my thrust is caught on this shield, it probably won't hit him, but will scoot off to the side. Let's try this one. If my thrust is caught on this shield, let me just point it towards the camera, the lip, the upturned lip, will grab the point, and it's more pronounced the point your, your weapon is. So with a sharp, um, we notice that uh, sharps will grab into shields regardless of um, regardless of their shape. Um, it's it's rare that a sharp will skate off of a shield the way that blunts do. But um, unless you're really throwing the strike, unless you're, unless you're really throwing a blow, and most people don't with sharps. But be that as it may, our my point is stopped thanks to this upturned lip. 
And if we go back to screen share you again. If we go back to these fellows, we can see that the upturned lip on the top and the bottom could very easily perform the function that I just demonstrated. But what also happens is because of these upturned lips, the shield in general prevent, presents a, a concave face to the opponent. And if you have a concave face like this, that does something very interesting. If you, uh, if you present the shield to the direction of the attack, um, here, I'll give you this. Um, come in like this. Now he has to withdraw the same direction that he came in and uh, come in from another orientation. Rather than skating up or skating down to continue the attack, as you would be inclined to do in, say, a, uh, for our sports, rapier or cut and thrust, this denies you that opportunity. Just, sorry, I got it. It's just, you can't do it. It's a C shape, it's a concave shape. Whereas on a, a flat shield, you can continue the attack up or down, whichever direction is, is convenient. If it's like this, obviously you'd want to go down. I don't think I have to explain that. But these, this concavity acts as a blade trap. So your whole shield has become a trapping surface. And I think this realization shaped the whole development of 15th century shields. We see, um, we see, if shields previously had been glancing surfaces, if convex surfaces are glancing surfaces, then concave surfaces are trapping and control surfaces. Let's go back to my little Tallhofer buckler, which is where I started personally. Will you take the rapier? Will you thrust at the shield? Can you believe the control that I have here? It's pretty profound, and it comes from these little scallops. If a, a blade is caught in one of these scallops, so long as I apply pressure, I now have control of my opponent's weapon. That's pretty useful. Now, that doesn't, that's not an, a silver bullet. It's a, obviously, because as soon as I have control, my opponent's obviously going to withdraw the blade and come in for another attack. But because I've interrupted his, uh, the flow of his fight, I have between a quarter to a half second of time that I wouldn't have with a different shield. That's not enough to throw a fight, but it is enough to gain advantage. And so the, the progression of 15th century shields flows in this direction towards increased trapping surfaces, increased control surfaces, and well, and then offensive surfaces as well. I think we can all see that uh, this spiked umbo or boss wouldn't be pleasant as a as a knuckle duster. So I think we've covered the early evolutions of the shield well enough. Let's look at um, where things went from there. Um, let's talk about round shields. Uh, round shields saw a, huh, a renaissance in the 15th century for I'm not even going to speculate on the reasons. Um, I have seen it speculated, and I have to agree that there was a, a yearning towards the classical world and um, a recreation of historic designs in the late Middle Ages. All right, do we see the shield? Or the, these guys, okay. Um, 
you can see that this round shield is strapped. Uh, you can also see from this fellow that it is lightly domed. And uh, more importantly to my eye is this rim that appears around the dome. Now, early on, I made myself a domed round shield. I thought, well, what's a 15th century warboard look like? Domed round shield, I'll make myself one. And it works really nice. It is one continuous glancing surface, but what I didn't realize until probably two years after I'd gotten it is that I made it improperly. If you look at my dome, uh, it doesn't really appear on camera very well, but you can see that there is a, a little lip around it. That lip is very functional. I think I mentioned it earlier on. It acts as a blade trap. And if you give it just a little bit more space, it works so much better than mine does. You can see in historic examples, let's try this fellow. Uh, this is circa 1450, let's say. Uh, obviously it's St. Michael casting the damned into hell, but he has a extraordinarily domed round shield with a very pronounced lip. And I think, especially for our sports, this size and shape of shield is very compelling. I think you could do an awful lot with a shield of this shape. Um, that uh, maybe four inch, four inch lip will, that'll trap any blade that you want it to trap. Um, but we see, see round shields of all sizes and shapes. Uh, I will lump oval shields into the round shield category uh, because we do see an awful lot of ovals as well. Uh, let's see. I don't have all that much to say about round shields, except that that lip is very, very important. Um, for the functionality of a shield. Um, now, the dome, the dome does something very interesting. Um, if you have a flat shield and you try and strap it, the, uh, let's say the center of mass of the shield is sitting somewhere right about here, okay? If you curve the shield, as we do with our heaters typically, the center of mass moves more towards the center of your arm. When the center of mass is more or less where your arm is, the shield becomes much more nimble. If you have a round shield and you want to strap it, putting a dome on does pretty much the same thing. see. Yeah. Uh, you can see that the center of mass of the shield is right in my arm. I think in the 15th century, people figured that out and started playing with it. You see um, increasingly domed heater shields. Let me see if I can find a good example for us. Um, Oops, that's the wrong folder. It's this one. No wonder I couldn't find it. Uh, well, let's look at this. This is a very famous example. Uh, here, uh, this is the funerary shield of the Black Prince. Uh, it's a very well-known and well-studied shield. Um, it's gorgeous, is it not? That just the, all of that high relief, that sculpted leather is beautiful. But even from this single picture, you can get an impression of how deeply domed that shield was. Or not domed, excuse me, deeply curved. So much so that it would be uncomfortable to carry strapped diagonally the way that we typically do. Um, 
I'm going to run through a bunch of my pictures and see if I can find a, uh, an example of these guys carrying their shield strapped down the center. Ah, yeah, here's a good one. And this is actually from the 14th century, too. Um, here we go. I don't recall what battle this depicts, but you can clearly see a heater or maybe even teardrop shaped shield strapped on the center with the point mm, facing down, facing towards the enemy, certainly pointed in a potentially offensive direction. And we're going to get into that later too. Um, but what I would really like to show you guys is what they started doing with their heater shields. Uh, the heater shield is perfectly appropriate for the 15th century. Uh, they started using um, strange heater shapes. Uh, in fact, I have a whole folder called oddly shaped heaters. Um, I found it. There it is. Here we go. Um, this is from the scene of the resurrection, the, the sleeping guards guarding the tomb. Look at his heater shield. Isn't that wild? What's happened is um, they have created an integral shield boss in the shield. They have sculpted the wood of the shield to create a an inset for your arm. And we see that several times. Um, where's another good one? I beg your pardon, I just have too many examples. There's Oh, this one. Yeah. Now, how about that? Oops. Isn't that fascinating? Now, we have evidence that uh, when shields were strapped down the center, that they could be carried point up or point down. Uh, there's fairly, fairly clear evidence of both. There's also plenty of evidence that they were center gripped, even when they were built like this. And you can see how easy it would be to make an H or I shaped handle um, and use that much like most people use the a pavass today. And it was actually this experimentation with integral shield bosses built into heater shapes that I believe is what led to the pavass. Um, since we were talking about it, let's show you this. This is the backside of a pavass, or a pavass. Uh, we've got a, a T-shaped handle um, it's made with rope that's wrapped in leather and glued, so it's fairly stiff. Um, but we've got two handles on it. Uh, we've got a center grip handle, and we've got a strap down the center handle. So the same shield, soldier had it strapped to use both ways. Now, when, when this fellow was using his was using it as a uh, strapped down the center, let's say. Like this. He was probably in, well, probably in a shield wall, more or less. And he had two, uh, two rings for an umbo strap. 
to carry it around his shoulder. And we see an awful lot of use of, no, not on boat, what is it? Gauge. gauge. Uh, we see an awful lot of use, use of the gauge in the 15th century. Way more than you would expect. Um, since we're talking about the Pavis, yeah, okay, let's talk about the Pavis. Um, the Pavis comes in all shapes and sizes. Um, from the very, very large, large enough to be carried by multiple men, to the almost buckler, and they were all called pavis. Don't ask me why, they were. Um, I think of the pavis as a shield that has an integral shield boss shaped like a channel running down the center of the shield. However, there were shields where that was obviously not the case, and they were still called pavis. Um, let me show you this. Okay, uh, this shield is from an inventory in uh, Nuremberg. Um, it's a tower shield. It's a plain, slightly curved tower shield. Uh, and it's called a pavis. Everyone refers to it as a pavis. So, are tower shields period? Actually, yes. What's really interesting about this one is this little spike up here. But we'll talk about that later. Um, there are dozens of pavises that contain um, a. Uh, now we started talking about it. I'll start. I'll, yeah, we'll just keep talking about it. There's little beaks on pavises like this. Have you seen this? These little horns on these shields, no one can really figure out uh, precisely what they're for. Um, I've seen speculation that they were a uh, well, they were a weapon rest for crossbows. Um, I think there's decent reason to assume that that might have been the case. But if you look on this one, the bottom of the shield is curved. This was intended for use by an infantryman. It was not intended to be set up and used by a crossbowman. So why did it have a beak? Well, there are a number of fanciful shapes that start appearing in 15th century shields. And as you recreate them, well, some of them begin to, to, to reveal their purpose. So that little beak that we just looked at is reasonably similar to this, this scroll on this shield that I built that we will talk about later. But will you grab a heater shield? When I built this, um, I was pondering what, what are these, what's this, what's this, why these fanciful shapes? Well, if we're not fighting with a boxer stance like that we do in the mid realm, but we're fighting with something that you see in period art. In period art, you see a lot of this, right? Well, if we take that stance, this scroll acts like a shield hook for your shield. Would it not be awesome to have a little hook on your shield, go up to a shield wall, and then start unzipping the shield wall with your shield? Food for thought. Um, so that's what I believe that those beaks on pavises were. Um, I think uh, when I, I, I realized that, I actually made a pavis. I don't have it here. It's actually an Onsiora right now with a shield painter. Uh, I made it too heavy, so I decided if it was too heavy, I was at least going to make it pretty. But I had this beak on the shield, and it's, it's as soon as I made it, it's, a, its purpose announced itself. Like Ewart Oakshot made the observation that the weapon demands its use or commands. I don't remember. Either way, the, the weapon will tell you what it wants to do. If you just hold it, 
It says, I do this thing and I do it well. Um, so the, the other beauty of the Pavis is, is the inside corner. Okay, this one, this Pavis isn't finished, but it's good enough that we can demonstrate the use of the inside corner. What we're often seeing uh, is the use of the Pavis kind of like any other center grip heater. That's appropriate, uh, but especially for if you're fighting someone who thrusts, <coughs> rape your fighters. Uh, here, that this inside corner is an outstanding trapping and control surface. Uh, most fencers default to what I call the waffle chip shield. We all know what I'm talking about. Um, the double S curved shield uh, that appears in the 16th century. And that really does appear to be the apotheosis of all of these divergent shield shapes where it was boiled down and condensed. It, it, it condensed itself into that shaped target. But don't discount a pavis if you fight uh, rapier or cut and thrust. Uh, this, these control surfaces are, they're no joke. They're no joke at all. And they're not particularly hard for us to make. Um, that's um, another obstacle that we modern people have in recreating these shield shapes. Maybe I should talk about that now. We have plywood. The Romans used plywood. Um, you can do some very interesting things with plywood. You can curve it in basically one dimension. And so it's easy for us to recreate the simple curves of the early medieval period, early high, well, even in the late medieval period, they were still dealing with one curve, a curve in one dimension. But that's not what we see in the 15th century. We see curves in two dimensions, so we see even recurves, different a curve and then recurve, S shapes. Almost impossible for us to recreate in plywood. Well, that's because they weren't using plywood. From the Dark Ages to the end of the Renaissance, shields were made with plank construction, edge glued. Now you can, you can tell if you just plane your edges, um, you can glue up is this showing up on camera? Okay, against my shirt, yeah. Uh, you can glue them up flat, you can glue them up curved. It doesn't really matter. So how were they creating curves in multiple dimensions? Ask the barrel makers. My brother, the woodworker said, ask the barrel makers, and that's exactly right. You bend your, your, your stakes, you steam bend them in one dimension, and then you just make them up, and you have a complex curve very simple, very simple. For us, it's like pulling teeth because we, we never got to this point in the first place. Very vanishingly few reenactors will build shields that they intend to use with edge glued construction. Somebody might do it for an arts and sciences project. But in order to use, we want something that we can make relatively inexpensively because we're making them ourselves. Um, and with relative ease. The plywood fits the bill for that. Um, these edge glued shields were surprisingly robust, especially when they're faced with uh, linen and parchment, because that's basically a primitive fiberglass, uh, a reinforcement for this direction. Uh, but in period, that's not what people did. We expect to use the same shield for three to five years of relatively constant use. Uh, we will treat our shields nicely. We'll take them in out of the rain. In period, that's not what people did. They treated them as not a disposable, but certainly a consumable item. And, you know, men at arms bought shields. They expected to buy more. They had several in stock. Well, if your shield maker is accustomed to making shields like this, it's no great 
leap to go from this to this. That's that's no great. It's uh, he's right there already, but because we're using plywood, we never got to we never got to this in the first place. So our leap to this is it's a bigger step for us. It, it even was for me, and so I've made a number of complex shapes. This guy was my first. Um, and should I talk about the encrunch or should I talk about how I made the complex shapes? Complex shapes? Let's talk about that. Um, where I made this was I cheated. I cheated. Uh, where are we? Where are you, folder? Folder, you are in the worst place ever. All right, here is where I started. I started with the sketch of an encrunch and a bunch of topographical lines. I made a topographical drawing of the shield, okay? The thing with building a complex shape in my method is you cut two blanks and then you cut out your topographical lines, but you don't cut every line, you cut every other line, okay? Is you're going to glue it up and you're going to have a hundred percent coverage I suppose glue coverage yes um, between the layers so let's see if okay this, did the image change everybody did the image change Have yes the image changed. Now? okay great so you cut out two blanks and then you cut on the topographical lines but you can see that this piece here did not mate with this piece, it mated with this piece, all right? And this piece here does not mate with the one that it's sitting on, but rather the one behind that, all right? Can we see what, see what, I've, been, what I've done here? So there's a big glue surface here and here and here because there, there's, there's this much Blue surface, right? So I screwed them together since I knew I was going to be carving it down and filling it in anyway. And that's exactly what I started doing here. Um, I'm using a chainsaw disc on an angle grinder. Uh, that's a, an Excalibur disc. Uh, and I have the scars from it. So I don't recommend using a chainsaw disc, uh, even though I still do. Uh, I recommend using a, uh, an abrasive disc. There are uh, abrasive discs from the same guys who make these chainsaw discs that have little spikes, like it's a giant spinning rasp, and that's much better for this. The reason being, chainsaws are intended for carving a whole piece of wood. You don't have grain direction changes in uh, a tree but you do with this stacked laminated plywood. Uh, so abrasive discs, rasp discs are much better than chainsaw discs, but you use the tool you have, and sometimes we suffer for it. So I got it to here, and uh, then I filled in, rather than continuing to sand, I actually filled in with Bondo. Sorry, it's not period. Uh, and then I added a handle. Yeah, here we go. This is all made pretty with body filler. And then I fiberglassed it. Now, I took my cues from the Vitus method. Sir Vitus von Atzinger has a wonderful uh, edgeless shield tutorial on the Armor Archive. Uh, he uses canvas and uh, marine grade epoxy. Uh, I skipped the canvas and I used normal fiberglass and uh, the normal fiberglass resin too. And it has been a very robust shield. Although I will say that after a couple of years of use, 
the um, the edges have suffered a bit. And Vitus talks about that even in his uh, edgeless shield tutorial. So um, if you want something that's bomb proof, I would go ahead and edge the shield probably in, um, I would use raw height if I was going to do it again. Here's me reinforcing the edges. And I'm also reinforcing the handle on there, the integral handle. And uh, I actually put some color under the fiberglass. And here's my, my baby, just as it was finished up, all nice and pretty. And here it is now. It still looks nice. But you can see, I think, that you, the edges have have shown some wear. Um, what this shield informed me uh, was the functionality of the bouche. Um, we have pictures, I'll show it to you in a little bit, of knights using the bouche much like those old band sliders. Remember the, uh, the pipes that you would uh, shoot a spear shot through? Well, they were using the bouche in the same way. And that is not against our rules. So um, there, are, there are images of a knight uh, with a, actually a, a bouche in a pavis. It's a much larger shield. And he's, he's doing exactly that. And I've always thought that it would be a lot of fun to take uh, a six foot spear, one of these little shields out to a, well, I think the woods battle would be about the perfect place for this weapon system. But um, you see shields like this used in single combat with swords. I wonder why, what, what is this good for? And once again, will you take the heater please? Yes. Um, well, it's good for that. Now, blades have bounced out of this, and I suppose theoretically it's not impossible that you could trap a blade. There's no way that you're going to catch one, but it is perfectly possible to find a blade and then seize it. Okay? So once you've already stopped the blade, International Ceiling Scratchers Association, what can I say? Uh, once you've already stopped the blade and you have it in the bind, then you can seize it and manipulate it with the bouche on your shield. And actually, the placement of the bouche uh, seems to have had some, uh, some regional preferences. Uh, the French liked theirs in the corner. Uh, I believe the Germans liked theirs uh, oriented up like a hand. And then there was, I don't recall, someone liked theirs sticking out sideways. Was it, was it like the Hungarians or something like that? I don't remember, but yes, there was there was some uh, region that liked theirs sticking outside. Of it. So where you put the, the mouth of the shield, the claw, really, um, is very personal. Uh, but God, I don't think I'm ever going to make another shield that doesn't have one of these. It's so useful. Uh, so the mouth in personal combat becomes a grabby hand. For your shield. Okay? Um, now, that's been my experience. Uh, I'm, I've been communicating with a, uh, a number of reenactors. Uh, there's a fellow named uh, Arn Coates. He's a reenactor from Europe, and he built a, uh, another Encrunch, and he had it stapled to his pauldron. And what he, what he discovered was that he could fight on foot with his visor up using the, the bouche as kind of a peep sight. He could just shrug the shield in front of his face uh, and fight with his visor up without any particular fear 
of getting gagged in the face. Um, and uh, I think even in, I think in Russian, in the Russian language, the, the bush is recalled, is called the peep site or the peephole. So um, just from the etymology, we can see that uh, that was a thing that people were doing in period. Um, I have no depictions of um, anyone using the bouche as a claw as I've described. I do have depictions, in fact, I'll show you here in a second, um, people use it to manipulate their own weapon, but not your opponents. But if you can do one, you can do the other. Um, me and Crunch, we're going to start looking at pictures again, is, is the iconic 15th century shield. That is what everyone thinks of um, when they think of shields in the 15th century. But we see a lot of variation um, in the, the shape and the size. I based mine off of, come on, open. Hey, Reinhold? Yes. Um, Sir Vercenzo said um, in the chat here, one, he mm -hmm. uploaded a picture um, for a shield he uses for later questions. And then he said, no use of sliders on spears or pikes out here. That might be an issue oh, on that's, using. Oh, that's society wide. That okay. I've been in discussions with our Earl Marshal, um, we decided that. Weapon on shield was weapon on shield. And even though it's performing the function of those old sliders, it's still weapon on shield. And since, especially since, uh, I'll go ahead and uh, show you the image. Since we have documentation that this is a period practice, uh, I don't know. Maybe your, your Earl Marshal might be unreasonable, but I think that someone who is... Um, a historical reenactor. Um, I don't know. I, here's the history. Here's what I want to do. I want to do this historical thing. Can we do this in our, our historical martial art? I would find it hard to say no, but I may. Um, your mileage may vary. I haven't tried it out, so I can't say that I've gotten a lot of mileage out of it. But um, this is Here. Okay. Um, I think this is David and Goliath, actually. Um, I, th I think that's what this is depicting. But note the use of the gauge strap. Even though David over here, or maybe it's maybe it's Goliath beating up some other Israelite, I don't know. Um, even though he is center gripping the shield. Um, he's got the gauge strap, and um, Goliath over here is just letting it dangle down to his side. Um, but that's what I modeled my crash on. But there are such such a uh, uh, beautiful variety of shapes. I'm going to share another one here. This fellow, um, this is on the top of a um, oh, what's it called? It's not a double cup. A mazer? Yeah, it's on a mazer. Uh, a mazer is a uh, it was used as a wedding gift. Uh, it's a ceremonial goblet. It's usually constructed out of uh, like a burl wood or uh, a soft stone um, and then topped with something decorative. Um, this is, uh, you know, one of the wild men of the hills. Um, I believe this example is from Burgundy. Um, so uh, I've seen a, uh, man, this, this kind of encroach is kind of like a snow shovel. It really does scoop up any any shot that that sticks in it, in, in those internal flutings, 
um, it's 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 like a vacuum cleaner for for spear points. It really works well. You can you can see how it became common practice to staple in a crest to your breastplate and catch lances that were coming at you because it worked so well. Um, let's see. no, not you. Let's look at another. Um, This is a German example, and here is an example, uh, one of the earliest that I saw of these peculiar scrolls that I recreated on a later shield. And I still don't know how these were accomplished. I suspect that they were left thick and carved in. That's just my guess. I don't see how you could do that with steam. Uh, and in fact, I believe that is how Encranches were built in general. Um, these flutes were carved in to thicker blanks, you know, uh, rather than attempting to laminate or building them up with gauche. Is that how it's pronounced? Gauche? Um, building them up with, uh, with filler, basically. Uh, I think that they were carved in to the um, individual planks. Um, but since we see those scrolls, I'm no, I think we should still talk about, about this fellow. Okay, um, this is uh, from the Feck book, Goliath. Um, We've got two men with sword and spear and shield using and crashes as bucklers. And <clears throat> what I'm thinking we're seeing, will you take the ranger, please? Is, yeah, about like this, right here. Um, yeah, that's about right. Okay. So this concavity gives me the same control that I demonstrated with the tall hunter buffer earlier on in class. Now what I found fighting with this personally is that these are very, very sticky shields. And anyone who's engaged in regular or kind of thrust should think about it because this is nice. Now, I've only taken this out. Um, I have not fought with this in armor, but I have fought against heavy weapons against this and its stickiness is not quite the same because of padding of our tips it's sticky stickier than um, a flat shield certainly much stickier than a convex shield but it's not quite the same um, so for, for the armored community, may I recommend going German? Ah, uh, this is a fun one. Let's look at you first. Share screen. Shield. All right, this guy is from 1415. Um, look at the scallops on that guy. Isn't that fascinating? You've got a shield. Um, it is center gripped. Uh, it has a reinforcing rib down the center of it, and it has these two corners turned out and scalloped. Now, what I think they were doing was for first giving them a couple of interior corners for trapping the blades. But I think these scalloped edges were intended 
to press up against your opponent's shield or weapon and gain control as you were pressing against them. I think we can demonstrate that. Here's the buffer. Have a shield, have a sword. And so, just for the purposes of demonstration, I'm going to say that we're going to trap the blade. Uh, we've, we've set the way around. Let's go around here. Trap the blade against the shield. And that's not particularly uncommon. But if I were going to do that with a pass, I'm fairly certain he can pop his blade out. If I do that instead with this scallop, he's going to have a more difficult time. And I think that's what we were seeing on that scallop shield. Let's look at a few more examples. There is the tall bumper shields, which I'm sure you are familiar with. What's going on here? Stop that. But personally, my favorites are these fellows in the inventories of Nuremberg. How about that? Isn't that fun? You have a kind of spike-tailed, scallop-edged shield with a number of stacked concavities or stacked flutes. Let's see if I can. Ah, yes. Here's another. Well, those are flutes too. Oh, lots of interesting floating around the edges of this round shield. All right. <laughs> Isn't this kind of wild? Um, these flutes, if taken to their logical extremes, can be, I don't believe these spikes are offensive. Not at this point. I think what was happening here on this beautiful little buckler that was in the I don't remember which museum. I'm sorry. I'll have to look up the museum that this is in. Um, but this beautiful little buckler is leather with a lot of uh, iron work on it. And I think what they were doing oops stop that. I think what they were doing was making a how should we say, a sword breaker shield. But much like the sword breaker dagger didn't really break swords. It was really more of a sword catcher dagger. That's what I think this shield was. I think it was a, a trapping shield. So that when you caught, uh, just where you're sitting, and where you caught, you could trap against, I, I can't really do it because my edges are not turned up enough, but you can you can see kind of yeah here you can see how you've got the very beginnings of a uh, I don't want to say trapping surfaces but a trapping device a blade trapping device and in the SCA, we do have to be conscious of where we, um, how far we go with blade catching and trapping, because we have rules specifically against that. Um, but especially if we're working in HEMA or working on something experimental, um, I think that's worthy of experimentation. Using these concavities and these, these edge scallops they almost act like fingers to, um, to catch and manipulate a blade. Something that we had talked about is how difficult it is to roll around a concave surface. Now we were speaking more like how difficult it is to roll around a concave surface like this, but 
these are also concave surfaces. So again, from where you're sitting, if you were going to redirect and roll around, these scallops do act like fingers stopping the blade. Now, that's not to say that you can't withdraw and redirect your attack. You can, but it takes you withdrawing and redirecting your attack as opposed to continuing in one smooth motion. Um, so I think that's what we were looking at with these, mm, let's call them scalp tower sheets. Reinhold? Yes. There's a question in the chat. Um, are there indications of the types of wood used in the construction? No, at least I, I don't know that. Um, I've had um, a number of detailed pictures. Some of them were sent to me directly um, so that we can see how the shields were constructed. I can see the planks. I can see the leather edging that was stitched on. So when we are doing rawhide edging in the SCA, we're doing it exactly right. That's, it's very clear that that's what's being done. You can see the linen and, or parchment uh, facing, but I don't have any indication of what, of what woods were used. Um, I'm sorry, I don't. We know linden was used. Um, I believe we know that ash was used, but sorry. Um, where were we going from here? Where was I going? Oh, yeah, I was going to talk about spike tail sheets. And I don't have a better name for them. In fact, we looked at a few of them already. Those scalloped tower sheets have a fairly prominent tail on them. And this one that we looked at, actually both of the ones that we had looked at previously, when I was talking about the strangely shaped heaters. Let's look at this again. We can look at the integral shield boss. We could also look at this iron shod spike down at the bottom. As I think you saw, oops. Well, here's another. Yeah, another iron shod spike down at the bottom of the shield. Yeah, sure. And here's another. So if we talk about increasing or adding functionality to the shield, um, we see that shields were fairly quickly becoming weapons. I don't think that they, they had ever not been weapons. It's far too easy to punch with a shield. But once you add this iron shod spike on the bottom of it, well, that, that changes the equation somewhat. This fellow is built off of the example from the Cenotaph of Maximilian. And I'm going to see if I can pull up a, an example of it here for you. Um, yeah, right here. Here we go. Kind of cool, huh? And also completely incomprehensible. Uh, without, without making it, I, I couldn't even see it properly. It, it's very strange. Without understanding its purpose, sometimes you can't even describe or recreate what you're seeing. So I made a quick sketch of a reproduction, pounded out of aluminum, and I, I realized, oh goodness, all of these, all of these scallops they really do have a function. Uh, and that was when I, uh, well, getting ahead of myself. Are any of you familiar with um, the English numbered cuts system? Um, it's an English saber. Um, this is cut number one, cut number two, cut number three, cut number four, five, and six. 
um, it was a, a way of describing the way that a fight would flow. Take the shoe, please. One, two, two, three, four, five, six. They've got cutouts, scallops, for each of the cuts. Here, let's point over here. I don't know that that actually did them a lot of good, but I think that is what, what the designer of that shield was going for. What he was also going for was this scroll, this shield hook that we've talked about. And finally, what I think he was going for was this. Putting this, this spike, even a wooden spike, on the bottom of your shield is a In Judah Lahatch, uh, the author, I don't, I don't even know that we know the author's name in Judah Lahatch. Uh, he wrote that anyone who, who begins the fight leading with the head is a fool. He was saying, don't, if we'll pretend that this is a halberd and that the head is up here. He says, don't start here. He says, start back here. Start with the cue and then finish up with the head. And I think these spike-tailed shields, these species of shields, lends themselves to that. When I first made this shield, I said, oh, okay, it's a shield hook, so I'm fighting with the hook. No, I think that's wrong now. I think you fight like this. You can begin parrying way out here and then sweep in with the shield hook, if that's appropriate, or with the, with the point. So we see the shield being used as a weapon. We see it being used as a claw. We see it being used as a trapping surface. Um, We've covered most of the varieties of shield that I've identified. Um, I'll, I'll just run through them. Uh, the early evolution from the heater shield, uh, the encranch, the pavas, round shields, spike-tailed shields, scalloped shields. Oh, the cross shield. The cross shield is a very interesting shield. And it's not one that you would expect to see. Let's take a look at a couple. Uh, yeah, let's take a look at St. Michael. Now, this one doesn't look particularly like a cross. It just looks like a couple of scallops. I began making a reproduction of this shield. This fellow. But I abandoned it because as shiny as that shield was, I came to believe that it wasn't made of metal. And that's what this is. Maybe one day I'll finish it up for the novelty of it. But I thought that that was a, a one of strange 16th century fantasy shield. No, it was not. And in fact, that's a trap that far too many historians fall into. They'll see something that they don't understand, and they say that that was the artist's embellishment, and they will dismiss it. No. Be very, very cautious of that. Trust the art. Be, be skeptical, but trust the art. Don't blithely dismiss our primary sources, because that's what the art is. They are primary sources. There's far more legitimacy in the art than there is in any number of our words. Uh, Let's take a look at, yeah, this fellow. Let's look at you. Share screen with you. Okay, 
Now, I think you can see why I began to call this the cross-shaped variety. Um, these shields did not appear to have any, um, any integral shield boss. I don't see much evidence of bosses, although there is. Um, but what you do see is Let's look at you. Not bad. Aha. Here we go. What we do see is very rigid reinforcement on the tail of the shield. Now that, that has to be offensive. It has to be. What else could it be? Um, but you can see the, the cross shape. And honestly, I believe that that was the origin of this strange little monster shield that I recreated here. Looking at you again. Yeah. Because although this doesn't appear to be a cross, if you're accustomed to looking for that those several cutout shapes, I think you can see in here that that's kind of where it started and they just added a bunch of embellishments up on the top. This scroll is not unique um, in these cross-shaped shields either. Um, let me look at this one from France. Do you see this all over here? I just got asked by my brother, do we see this all over Europe? E sort of. Um, okay, here's one from France. Um, and this, this crook, this fold over, is uh, something that we see several times in France. I've seen heater shapes have this. Uh, the scroll we've looked at before. We're gonna look at another example here in a minute. This one is fairly obviously center gripped. And you can see the gauge strap unbuckled, but still integral on the shield. So, pretty cool, huh? Um, the first example of this shield didn't lend itself to me really understanding what I was looking at. It. Uh, we're going to go back to another painting of St. Michael. Uh, the military saints. St. Michael, St. Florian, St. Uh, Maurice, um, Sebastian? Yeah, St. Sebastian. Um, although he's more hunting than military. George. St. George, oh yes, obviously, St. George, uh, are wonderful examples of all of this military hardware because everyone was painting them all the time and they were painting them with the most up-to-date stuff. So this shield that St. Michael is using, I thought, neoclassical garbage, because that's what the breastplate is. Uh, just, what's, what's going on here? What is this scroll? How could this scroll, how could this thing be functional? And then I make one, and then I realize what it's for. It's a shield hook on your shield, and oh my goodness, my eyes were opened, and ah! And that, that's, that's really how the, the art is, um, it's, it's, we'll look at another one. Here's another variety of the cross shape shield and they do have the integral shield boss. You can see in the center. Now that would be enough to stick your whole forearm in or enough to Hold a uh, hold a center grip. You choose. It seemed that they certainly did. I don't think that there's any any particular reason to uh, assume strapping one way or the other. It seems very highly personal. I was asked, "Do we see these all over Europe?" No, no, we don't. Um, there are a couple of places in Europe that were very conspicuously not playing this game. One of them was England. Uh, as much as we like 
the English because we speak English. We enjoy reenacting the English. They, they whooped up in the Hundred Years' War. It's fun to be English. But what the English were doing at the time that all the rest of Europe was experimenting with these fascinating shield shapes, they were stubbornly using meters. All through the 15th century on monumental effigies, we see heaters, heaters, nothing but heaters. England at the time must have been considered painfully old fashioned, even regressive, that they were stubbornly hanging on to these heaters. Now they got small, they got very small indeed. Like you see uh, effigies with heater shields not much larger than this. So it's not that they weren't cognizant of the, let's say, the evolution of combat. But they simply had no particular, inter in particular interest of playing the game of um, these better mousetraps. Um, and the other place that did not participate in um, these particular shield shapes, the cross shapes shields I see in uh, Italy and uh, Germany and France. That's it. Uh, but the other country or area of Europe that was not participating was Spain. Uh, because Spain had its own peculiar shield, and that is the Adarja. Let's take a look at a few. The Adarja. is identified by having a center crease and a heart-shaped top. This fellow has a darja. Let's look at a few more. Oops. No, stop that. Um, how, about, how about you? Yes, you. Well, this is a very early iteration. Uh, you can see the heart shape appearing, uh, it, and obviously this is not a 15th century depiction. Uh, this is uh, early 14th century, this is like 1430. Uh, it's really before the Hundred Years' War really got going. Um, it's really before uh, the development or wide adoption of plate armor. But you can see this heart shape top keep going and then it was coupled with uh, the round bottom. Now round bottom heaters were common in both Spain and Italy. I don't know why uh, but it's very apparent looking at um, Italian art that uh, if it had a square top it seemed to have a round bottom and that was the same way in Spain. Uh, but in both countries they held on to the teardrop shield. I don't know. Uh, they became uh, fairly domed uh, in the 15th century. You see uh, a complex shape. It's not no longer a flat plank. But uh, hey, Reinhold. Yes. A couple things. One, it's 828. Just so you know. Okay. And um, earlier, the question about the types of wood used. Um, he said um, in the chat that. Actually, you have answered uh, his wood question. The two mentioned, ash and linden, would both be ideally suited to the manufacturing techniques you've outlined. And thank you. Oh, great. Well, I'm happy we answered questions. Um, something just slipped my mind. Oh, I was going to talk about face shields. But talking about um, paying attention to the art and trusting the art, uh, there, are, there are a number of artistic cues in medieval art um, that are used to refer to antiquity. Uh, like if you're looking at armor, you will occasionally see a spiral shape or a snail shell shape on helmets, 
and uh, pauldrons and sometimes shields. Um, this was believed to refer to it as, the, uh, or to reference the snail of time. Um, and so you will, you will often see historians with an art background say that uh, if you see these historical cues, then the art cannot be trusted. Now, I'm okay with saying the art cannot be trusted, but that is very quickly built on or expanded to, to say that the art should be dismissed as a historical source. And that, I say, is... That's, that's crossing the line. I, I, I do not hold with that. There were um, these, these historical references to antiquity were uh, they referred to as al antiqua or al antica. Um, and they do exist. Uh, they are like the petroges from the Roman uniform. You see them on the shoulder or on the skirt. Uh, often the uh, falds will be depicted to, in, or to reference petroges. Uh, but you can't say that those things were never built in history because we have the very examples of neoclassical armors. Uh, people in history saw the, it's not just the artists who are saying, Oh, that's what people looked like in Rome, and that's it. No, a, a statesman might say, I am going to revive the glories of Rome and then purposely deck themselves in those historical signifiers or cues of Romanness to make himself look like the return of Alexander the Great, the return of Julius Caesar. There were, they, it could become a political statement. So. Just because something was old-fashioned uh, or known to be a depiction of something old-fashioned is not any reason to say that the art should be dismissed. And I say this because there is this whole family of strange shields, these grotesques, these face shields. And we'll look at a couple of them. Like this. That's David and Goliath. It would be very easy to say if all we had was this depiction of David and Goliath that that shield was uh, an, uh, a, a bit of nonsense, some fast, fantastical all antiqua. But that is not all that we have. We have this face shield. Um, that's Jason and the golden sheep. Uh, I don't recall who this is, but you can see a face for clearly here and here. But this doesn't look like David and Goliath, does it? It isn't. And here. But this is the crucifixion. So, and here. And here. And here. And here. So I, I must have probably 30. I'm not going to make you look at all of these pictures. It was a fairly common motif. But now if it was if it's impossible to build these shapes, well, then it's impossible. And it's an artistic innovation. thing is, it's not impossible. It's not impossible at all. Um, this shield was built by a gentleman, I hope I can call him a friend, named William Baskerville, uh, who has been experimenting with 
constructing 15th century shield shapes and really dove into recreating these, I will say much misunderstood shapes. Um, I believe that they were sculpted probably out of leather and gesso. I think they probably were. Now some of them, we have depictions that are very obviously painted on a flat surface. No harm, no foul. But sculpting three-dimensional shapes is not impossible. Not impossible at all. Remember that, uh, that funerary shield of the Black Prince? How highly relieved the sculpture was on that? We've got another hundred years to begin sculpting these, these beautiful, fantastical faces on shields. I think it was truly done. Um, I think I have just about talked myself out. Oh, the French fold. I forgot about the French fold. <laughs> uh, it's just another banana shield. Don't worry about it. If anybody has questions, I would love to field them. Let's go ahead and turn your mics on if you've got anything. Uh, I'll, I'll try and answer it now. Anybody? I have a question. Sure, shoot. Who's your fiberglass construction for um, heavy fighting as well as rapier? Yes, absolutely. Sure. Yeah. Uh, the only difference that, um, that I have made is I've built the shields a little bit thicker. Um, this one I have right here is uh, about between three eighths and a half inch thick. Um, I built another shield, the, uh, the French fold. Uh, Sir Gebhardt has been playing with that shield. Um, the, the takeaway is think of it in crunch, but fold it even more sharply and make the, uh, it, it's, I, I call it the fold because it looks like a, a draped piece of linen. It has a very sharp crease and it's folded up the side and it presents two very, very defined C shapes to your opponent. So if you look at the encranch, this is still mostly flat, but you can see it kind of has a, a little bit of a cloud shape. Now, if you, if you doubled that, if you made it more like that, then what you could do with your opponent is present a, a closed, a, a C shape um, to your opponent. And if you are in a cut and thrust environment where you're, you're attempting to extend with your cuts or extend with your thrusts, then uh, you've got this great big wall of uh, an area of denial. You know, you, you talk about cones of defense. Well, these concave shapes act as, as uh, cones of denial, not cones, they're not a cone at all. There's crescents, crescents of denial, yeah. And that's what the, the French fold seems to, to be. Uh, they were also often strapped on the shoulder with a gauge strap um, so that you could use a two-handed weapon. So that if uh, an attack was coming in, you just turn your shield or your shoulder one way or the other. Uh, <clears throat> but yes, they are absolutely for heavy also. Uh, so I made Sir Gephard a shield that is probably too thick. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's uh, it's about five eighths, and it's bomb proof. I mean, you could. I'm fairly confident that you could rock, roll a truck over it, and it wouldn't crack the shield. So I'm, especially if uh, it, it, these shields are so robust uh, this way, and even this way. But the edges, if you're going to make an edgeless shield, that's not robust. So if you're going to use the shield for heavy, I would go ahead and edge it. I really would. I would put some, uh, some rawhide edging on it. And, I, and at that point, I think it is bomb-proof. I think it's, it's almost an immortal shield. Like there is no way you're going to crack the, the glue seams apart on this. You're just not. I have a question about that shield too. If you edge it in rawhide, like you suggested for heavy armored combat, 
is there a precedent for that historically as well? Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. In fact, that's we can uh, let me see if I can find a picture for you. Uh, <clears throat> we have pictures where that is. It's patently obvious that that was how the shields were constructed. I've got one somewhere where it's edge on. Uh, it's not the one I was thinking of, but that'll do. Take a look at that. You can see the stitching. Oh yeah, definitely. All the way around the corner. And this is very clearly a, a, a separate piece. Now I don't know that it's rawhide. Might be leather. It, it's, mm -hmm. it's obviously a leather of some kind. Uh, I don't know that it's rawhide, but it's very clear, clearly a, a, an applied piece, piece of edge stripping that is stitched onto the shield. Now, uh, how soon did they start using shields like the one that you have in your example, and were there variations in size? Um, tell me more of the question. What kind of shield? Sure. So the the ran the cranch that you have right there in your hands. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, how? When was that first used? And is that the only size? Do you only see it in that shoulder size, or are there various uh, well, changes they, in shields with that particular shape? They were all smaller shields. Um, like so, you never see like so. The heaters got some got pretty big, um, and you never see them that big. But uh, like no, they they were not all small shields. Let me see if let me run through my pictures and see if I can find you the biggest one. Okay, this fellow looks like he's probably the representative anyway. How's that? Yeah, that's um, still pretty big, but you're right. It doesn't get heater size at all. No, but it's as wide as a heater is. It's just not as long. Mm -hmm. I would say that's, I would describe it as maybe a two foot square. Yeah, it looks like shoulder to shoulder and down to his waist. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know, you don't see um, you don't see those shields getting getting long, not in French. Now, there are some strangely shaped heaters that that have enough body to them that you would get some of the same action, and those got very long. Let me see if I can find a. Uh, uh, this one? Yeah. Highlight. There are some wonderful examples. This one? Yeah, this one. Okay. This guy. Okay. Now, this, oops, is French, <clears throat> and we've got the bouche and these complicated folds, this, this fold over on mm -hmm. a number of the shields here, and they are center grip. When, when is this artwork from? Uh, this is from 1445, 1450, I believe. Okay. <clears throat> um, and yeah, on, on this black one, you've got, and this one, this gray one, you can see that there's some concavity on the faces. Uh, yeah. Okay. So they were playing with, with a lot of shapes and, and, in Spain, the, the, the kite shield made a comeback. The kite shield, I, it did. Um, so you, I think you have a lot of justification for making almost any shield shape that you wanted. 
the, 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 the theme of the 15th century was trying to make a better mousetrap. And, and they did. And then they made better mousetraps again, always looking to have that about half a second to quarter second edge over your opponent. And then it got to a point where we're going to be leading off with guns anyway. Come on. Um, or you saw places that could not afford that arms race, like Scotland. They used the target. They added a spike onto the target, but it was a flat target. Uh, they faced it with soft leather so that a, uh, a point would bite into the face and it would serve much the same effect as a concave shield face with a quarter the cost of production. So uh, in, in poorer areas of Europe, they were not uh, participating in this better mousetrap race. Like we don't see this in Romania. We see the, uh, the bouche, the, the mouth, in Hungary, but we don't see any of these concavities. In Poland, uh, you do see the bush, but they made this giant wing on the back of their shield, uh, which seems fairly obvious that they were protecting from headshots. Um, the, the winged shields of the hussars, um, they didn't, now they never experimented with concavity either. Uh, concavity seems to be a Central European experiment, uh, Western Central European experiment. Uh, you see it as far down as, like I've seen Serbian examples, but I, I don't know why. I didn't, I didn't think they were particularly prosperous at the time, but there you have it. Want to address the comments in the chat and the photo we had? Oh, uh, in chat, uh, since trapping of the blade in SCA is not a common thing. I've used the scalps to redirect the attacking blade rather than stop it. Yes, corn is to stop scalps to redirect. Let's see, photo for shield shape. Well, let's look at it. Oh, cool. Yeah. In fact, let's, I'm going to share that. I think I'm going to copy your shield edging there, sir. That's, uh, that's nice. Corners, corners to stop and scalps to redirect. I, I can well believe it. Yes. What would you say the difference in weight is between my small red shield and the scalped metal one I made? Oh, uh, the small red shield is lighter by, I don't know, quarter pound maybe? It has a larger face and is notably lighter. Um, the maybe difference as much as a half pound. Maybe as much as a half pound, yeah. Uh, the difference between a, a light sword and a, a stout sword, I would say. Uh, of course, this one has gotten beat up over the course of two years, and this one is like new. So there is a difference in robustness. Okay. Well, we have gone on for about two hours. I really thank you for your attention, uh, and I hope to post this to YouTube soon. Sir, uh, an open position cuts into open position. position. Down and away, not rebound. Yes, yes, that makes sense. So uh, uh, the gentleman from the West, Sir. Sir Percenzo. Thank you. You're uh, welcome. Uh, so, I, I take it you're fighting in kind of the boxer's position as well, and shots that are coming into the center line are bumping off of these scallops and shooting to the outside. That's, yeah, that makes sense. Um, I hadn't thought about that. That's, 
yet another application for complex shields and SCA heavy. I'm sorry, I come from a, uh, a rapier background primarily, and so all of these make so much sense to me in certain contexts. And although I am an authorized heavy fighter, that's not my, that's not where my head is. So I see things that are very obviously of use on the heavy field. I'm like, aha, here, 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 here. But uh, some things are going to occur to you that just have not occurred to me. Um, but that about wraps it up. Once again, thank you very much. I really appreciate your attention and I hope this was of use.